In this problem, they're giving us a table of values of a function f of x, but as is so often the case, they won't actually tell us what the function f of x is explicitly. And then they ask us to reason about the integral of f of x, <clears throat> the derivative of x of f of x, and sometimes they want approximations, and sometimes they want exact results. So, as usual, I have put in some information that is uh, some formulas and other things that are going to be useful ahead of time that we will draw on. And for this problem, because there's so much going on, I've also pre-drawn a couple of illustrations. So let's go to part A. Part A asked me to estimate f prime of 4. And all I've done is I've taken the table of values and put them on a graph because I think it helps to better illustrate what's going on in question A. So first of all, we notice that we don't even know what the value of the function is at 4. And we certainly don't have any in information, or at least explicit information, about what the derivative of f is doing at 4. But we do know this simple thing, that the function has to somehow connect these dots. And so we simply observe that the simplest way to connect between 3 and 5 is to draw a straight line. And that straight line has a particular slope. I sure hope that line gets... Uh, not the straightest line, but you get my idea. That line has a slope, and that's going to be our best way of estimating the derivative at 4, the slope of the function at 4. So we're just going to use y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1 to estimate this. So we're going to write, uh, in our case, y2 is f of 5 minus y1 f of 3. And we're dividing by Uh, 5 minus 3. So f of 5 is negative 2 minus 4 and 5 minus 3 is 2 so our final answer we're going to get negative 3. And if we were going to add any explanation beyond what we've written I'm just going to say estimate the slope or estimate f prime of 4 by calculating slope of line from 5 to 3. from 3 to 5. That's uh, a little bit uh, shorthand, but I think that is enough to communicate that we know what's going on. I'm going to actually jump sequence and work on part C now because it's also an approximation and it also is useful to use this graph to visualize it. We're asked to use left Riemann sum using these subintervals that we've been given to approximate the expression of the indefinite integral. So we're going to write that the indefinite integral from 2 to 13 of f of x dx is really just the sum of those signed areas as we move from 2 to 13. And so I'm just going to write it out is approximately, this is a symbol, okay, sum of um, left Riemann rectangles. 
And so we're going to construct those rectangles. This first one has a width that goes from 2 to 3, and the height is its leftmost value. That's going to be 1. I'm going to just write that as 3 minus 2 times f of 2. Our next rectangle takes us from 3 to 5. And so that's 5 minus 3 times f of 3, because again, f of 3 is the rightmost height of this rectangle. Our next rectangle has a negative height. And so it's plus 8 minus 5 times negative 2. And our last rectangle uh, is 13 minus 8 with a height of positive 3. Notice, of course, as is always the case with left Riemann sums, the actual value at the right, far right side never enters into the calculation. 3 minus 2 is 1, f of 2 is 1, so this whole thing is going to be 1 times 1. 5 minus 3 is 2, f of 3 is 4, so that's 2 times 4. 8 minus 5 is 3, and I meant to write here f of uh, f of 5, but I just jumped the gun and wrote negative 2, which is fine. It's going to give us negative 6, and I meant to write here f of 8, but I just went ahead and wrote 3, so that's also fine. 5 times 3 is going to be 15. So we add all of these up, and we get uh, 1 plus 8 is 9, minus 6 is 3, plus 15 is 18. All right, those two, as I mentioned before, are just approximations. B asks for an exact result. So let's write out what they're asking for. We're looking for the indefinite integral from 2 to 13 of 3 minus 5 times f prime of x with respect to x. So we use some properties of integrals first. We use the sum and difference rule for integrals, which allows us to separate this into two separate integrals, an integral from 2 to 13 of 3 dx minus 5 times an integral from 2 to 13 of f prime of x dx. Now notice that I pulled the 5 out front. That's because of the linear property of indefinite integrals. This sometimes troubles students, um, but if you think about it, it's saying what is the signed area, as I go from 2 to 13, of the 3 function? And the 3 function is simply a horizontal line at 3. So this is nothing more than asking me to find the area of a rectangle that is 11 by 3. And so that area is 33. Now minus 5 times this indefinite integral. Again, you may be dismayed here because, as I've emphasized, we know very little about f, and we know essentially nothing about f prime. And yet they want an exact answer here. But the key is this is the fundamental theorem of calculus, and the reason that I've rewritten this formula as a reminder up here. Namely, if you want to know how the signed area of a function f prime of x adds up as you go from a to b, it's just the value of the original function at b minus the function at a. It's that simple. And so all we're really writing here is f of 13 minus f of 2. And what have we got for those values? Um, 
f of 13 is 6, f of 2 is 1, 6 minus 1 is 5, and so all we're really saying is 33 minus 25, and that equals uh, 8. Part D, I have to admit, conceptually is just a little bit challenging, and this sometimes throws students off. And that's the reason that I went ahead and drew this figure in advance. Okay? We're asked to first compare a tangent line at 5 with the actual curve, which we do not know. But the interesting information that we're given is we're told that f of f double prime of x is less than 0. And so the first point is, because f double prime of x is less than 0 over this whole interval, we know, and here, let me just put this in, here's the tangent line at 5. at x equals 5. Because f double prime of x is less than 0, we know that the curve gradually veers away and down away from the tangent line. The slope is decreasing and so the function itself gradually veers away. So let's just write that. f of x is down and away. from the tangent line. So another thing now is true, and that is, if we draw successive secant lines that start at 5 in every case, but go out farther and farther on the line, because this line is curving downwards the entire time, each successive secant line that starts at 5 has a smaller and slower, smaller slope. Okay, so f of x is down and away, and each successive secant line from 5 is less. Um, is, a li is less in its slope. than the previous. Okay. Now what does that mean? Well that implies that if we look at a particular x value, in this case when x equals 7, and we just go straight up, it implies that where the tangent line meets the x equals 7 curve is a higher height than where the function itself meets the x equals 7 curve is a higher height than where the secant line starting at 5 and going to 8 meets the x equals 7 curve. Now note that where the function f meets the x equals 7 curve, that is the value f of 7. Even though we don't know it, we know that this value is larger than it and this value is smaller than it. And that's what sets up the inequality. So let's just write this. We can write that the um, where, let's see, where tangent meets x equals 7 is greater than f of 7. And that, in turn, is greater than where the secant, the secant from 5 to 8, okay, meets the x equals 7 line. So to continue that inequality down, let's note a couple of things. First of all, they told us that the slope of this line was 3. They told us that the slope of this line was, well they didn't tell us, but it's the secant line from 5 to 8, and so we know its slope is 
y2 minus y1, namely 3 minus negative 2, that's 5, over 8 minus 3, 3. So this slope is 5 thirds. Okay. Now, where does the tangent line meet x equals 7? Well, it starts out at negative 2. Okay. This point 5 comma negative 2. Uh, its height. And then we go up with a slope of 3 and over a distance of 7 minus 5, which is 2. Okay. So that's negative 2 plus 6, and so this is 4. And similarly, this secant line, where does it meet x equals 7? Well, it starts out here at a height of negative 2, and it goes up by a slope of 5 thirds, and it goes up a distance 7 minus 5. And let's see, that's going to be 2, 5 times 2 is 10, 10 thirds. Negative 2 plus 10 thirds is like negative 6 thirds plus 10 thirds, and that's 4 thirds. And so we've shown that f of 7 has to fit in between 4 and 4 thirds. Now notice what we've proven are strict inequalities, the text asks us only to show that they are the weaker inequalities with equal signs. In my opinion, that's sort of sloppy work on behalf of the College Board, but who am I to say? At any rate, since we proved it for the strict inequality, it certainly holds true for the less strict inequality. So to recap D, just because I think there's a lot going on there, we know that f double prime of x being less than zero means that the curve itself veers away and down from the tangent line. That in turn means that each of the successive secant lines that start at five and go out to various distances in x, each one has a, has a smaller slope than the one before it. And that means that when we evaluate these lines at x equals seven, we'll have that same sequence where the tangent line evaluated at 7 is larger than the actual curve evaluated at 7 is larger than the secant line from 5 to 8 evaluated at f equals 7.